through that, obviously. And then all, the, all the stuff you saw, there was this, this capsule, and then there was the rover, and it had this thing over it called the sky crane. And it's on the sky crane that the batteries that I worked on are mounted, and they power that whole seven minutes. Everything is reliant on, on these little batteries, and it's one of the few places in the uh, whole mission everything is redundant. There's, if it's got to work, it has to work. Um, if it's going to work, the most obvious thing to do to avoid risk is to have duplicates of everything, right? And so what we uh, had to do, though, for these batteries is because they're so big and hot is that they have just one of each for what you need, right? And so they're, that's called a single point failure. And so the whole mission comes down to these batteries working when they have to for those seven minutes. And after that, they are crashing the surface of Mars on the top. The thing that lowers the, the rover down, cuts the ropes, and goes and just crashes down. That's it. That's all it's, it's made for. So it's an, an incredible amount of effort and time by hundreds of people and a, you know, a billion dollars for seven minutes of this landing. And it will probably never be done again. It's a ridiculous idea. Like it, the whole thing is preposterous, uh, but it's going to happen. Like this is real. So I guess I'll start with the batteries a little bit, just to give you guys a sense. These are called thermal batteries. They are uh, the exact opposite of our batteries in just about every way. Um, they're called thermal batteries, uh, as the name suggests, because they get really hot. Um, and what happens is you basically just like we do, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, you stack up the anodic cathodes inside the batteries. Um, the stacking is actually done by hand in Eagle Pitcher, um, even in Joplin, Missouri. Even for the flight, uh, the actual flight units, people are, there's, there's like three people observing and one person doing the assembly. So imagine an Ardojo room doing the builds and then having multiple NASA officials standing behind you with checkboards and cameras, filming every single step of the way. Uh, it's an extraordinary amount of oversight, you can't hardly believe it, but that's what you do. And then it gets built, it gets welded into this, uh, so the battery electrodes are stacked up, it's all dry, there's no infiltration, right? Instead you add salt, but just the straight salt, no water. So imagine doing one of our batteries dry, but salt, and then every electrode has a hole in the middle. So they're all, every, it's like a little donut shape, and then there's sort of this, this empty thing in the middle, and then you sprinkle salt in and all this stuff, and then in the middle of all that, you put a grenade. The, uh, sort of it's a pyrotechnic material that explodes and gets hot very quickly. And the idea is that then you make this thing and you weld it closed and it's like this self-contained thing and it is completely unusable. It doesn't work as a battery, it has no function whatsoever until you set off the grenade inside of it. And that melts the salt that you put in and it takes the whole thing up to four or five hundred degrees Celsius and it becomes a molten electrolyte, molten salt electrolyte battery and it will work about an hour. It'll, it'll, stay, it'll work to the extent that it stays hot um, and it will only stay hot for a short period of time. So this is a single-use battery that is made only for aerospace and military. Uh, it's used uh, in mission-critical things where money is not an option and you likely will use, use it for a handful of seconds or minutes, okay? It's often used, this kind of technology, to steer rocket motors, like uh, on missiles, to, to, to steer, like this thing is called gimbals, and that's the, the little drives that drive the motors or drive the fins on rockets because most rocket missions last not very long. So um, they use this because it has to work and it's relatively compact and all this stuff. So they decided to do this and they had, they had some competing technologies, but this was the one that was selected. And then I was brought on as a constant engineer to sort of be in charge of these batteries. And so I didn't know much about them, I learned about it, which is exciting and fun. Uh, but the other thing about it was the realization that there was a system that was really impacted by this. And there was so this, so that the thing that holds the rover and the sky crane thing that holds the rover, it's got these fins on it. They're called outriggers, all right. And the batteries were going to be mounted on outrigger panel number four. So it's basically this chassis thing with these little things that stick out, and you mount hardware on it, right? And there's these four batteries, and we have two different varieties. There's this big one, uh, PWTB, and this smaller one, PYTB. And it's all mounted on this really lightweight aluminum truss that's stuck as on part of the support structure for the sky crane thing. Um, and so the, the guys made all the mechanical design, they made it strong enough and all that, but they didn't accommodate the fact that these things get really hot. So hot that when you fire them, you dump all the heat in this outrigger and it heats the whole thing up to the extent that you mechanically destabilize this aluminum, which is this aluminum thing that's sticking on the side, and uh, to the extent that it might break off. And so then, there was this huge debate, well, how do we, how do, we do this? We, can't, we have to use this battery technology because we're already down the road with that. Uh, we have to change the design of this outrigger. 
And the, the most obvious thing to do was to add more aluminum so that you could have more heat capacity locally. So it would heat up the aluminum and not destabilize it mechanically. So we had to add 12 kilos of metal to this thing. It's a, it's this big, it comes in this huge piece of aluminum. It gets all hogged out by this giant, um, this giant CNC system and it weighs very little. So we added these 12 kilograms and that sent everyone else on a tizzy. Because you add 12 kilograms to a space mission, uh, it changes everything else about the whole thing. So that, then we had to go and talk to all the propulsion guys about, well, we added 12 kilograms to this. And they're like, why'd you do that? Well, because the batteries get too hot. They're like, well, move the batteries. We can't move the batteries anywhere else because there's no other spot to put them. Um, and so there was this, it literally took six months for this to be sorted out. And uh, so systems engineering now, and this looks kind of like what we do here. Uh, in any good system engineering uh, uh, practice, you start with requirements. What, whatever you're designing, what does it have to do, right? And so this is pretty simple. We had um, the we had requirement numbers, which should look familiar to some of you because we have requirement numbers here. Um, and we also have test numbers, and we had test numbers here. Every one of these requirement numbers had a specific test or multiple tests associated with it. But there's a load profile, activation time, maximum voltage, minimum voltage, shelf life, um, activation type, uh, compliance, mass, everything. So we had all these different things. We had to make sure that we our design was going to comply. So this is a slide from our critical design review, which was the review that we did uh, before sort of pulling the trigger on getting some of these built. And it's it, uh, we had to make sure that all this stuff was compliant, that our design was good, and that we were meeting the needs of the mission before we did anything else. And so we do this now in the system engineering part of this company when we talk like Eric Weber's crew and so forth. Uh, and my guess you, we're trying to understand what the customers need, what do their requirements look like, and does our battery meet these needs? Um, and this is the PYTB, and again, we've got a bunch of requirement numbers. This is the one that fires the pyros, and there's actually, interestingly, this one uh, is only for those spurty things, and uh, it interestingly has way more requirements because of that, uh, because and it's easier to keep a battery healthy and happy when you are discharging it continuously as opposed to doing a bunch of these little pulses, right? And so this came to the next problem. We got all this design put together for the batteries and then we interacted with the vendor, Eagle Pitcher, and they said, oh, by the way, you can't, uh, this PYTV, this is the smaller one that's just for these pulses, for the, for the pyro bolts, you have to have a continuous discharge out of that battery or else it might fail. And we're like, well, what do you mean it might fail? And they're like, well, it's like one in a thousand chance that it will fail. Uh, and then we, so we, then we go, we call up all the upper management at JPL. Hey, can we tolerate 1,000 chance of failure? And they're like, no, you cannot. You can, this cannot fail. Um, 1,000 is not good enough. It has to be perfect, uh, or as perfect as you can get. So then we come up with this thing where we're like, well, how do we do that? Well, how do you make a battery discharge continuously? You put a resistor across it, right? So there was this thing where we had our battery, right? And we have our bus over here and right this is the bus plus minus and this goes out to the to the pyros that are firing that are blowing up the bolts and the conclusion was we just have to put a resistor here in parallel with the load that's always drawing some base load a base load current through it and that constant base load current then is not so much that it will hurt the ability to fire pyros it'll keep the battery healthy right because it's always discharging we like that that was good um, so that's fine. And so they're like, uh, hey, Jake, could you do that resistor too? And I'm thinking, this is just a resistor somewhere like somewhere in there. Easy. I'm like, no problem. It's a resistor, whatever. Um, and they're like, oh, good. Thank you. Uh, please go do the resistor box. I, so I remember coming to the first meeting. I'm like, OK. I actually brought a resistor and said, here, we'll put this resistor in there. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa we can't do that. <laughs> um, and it went to, so if you want to do a resistor and you're in a fault, a fault tolerant design paradigm, this resistor actually has to tolerate a series of parallel failures. So you end up with this looking actually like this. Right? So you, this will tolerate, if any one of these resistors fails, open or short circuit, you still have a resistor in the path that will work, right? Now these are solid state ceramic resistors. How are they going to fail? I don't know. Doesn't matter. The point is you have to have a redundant design. So now, as opposed to being a resistor, you've got four resistors, and then you have to have all the inter But by introducing these resistors, you also inter introduce all these other potential failure points with how they connect in with each other and how they connect to the outside world. Uh, so you've got to put them in a box. Oh, and the box has to be really robust and well-designed, too. 
So it went from this to this thing. It has um, all these fancy things like plugged in there and there, and it goes there and there. So we got it uh, designed more or less, and this took a lot of time to design these resistors to, to put this load on this battery that no one planned for that we didn't need, et cetera, et cetera. And then we got it, and we're like, well, where are we going to put it? And so we went back to the same thermal guys. They were like, can we, we were going to mount it. They had, to, they had picked a place to mount it, and we did it. And then we ran the model and realized that the batteries themselves would heat up these resistors, and they would take them out of their specified use zone, and they could cause failure. So then we had to reroute this thing somewhere else, and we had to put cabling between everything in the backs and somewhere else because we had to mount it someplace else. So this doggone thing had to be mounted eight feet away from the battery. So we have the lines coming into the battery, and then all the way out of this box, and all the way back to the battery, and then all that. And ridiculous. I'm curious to see over the next couple of weeks how much publicity we, we get on this. No one wants to associate themselves right now because no one knows if it's going to land. Just watch and see how much press this gets. Is this going to be, uh, it's competing with the Olympics right now too, which is interesting. I don't know if uh, NASA figured that into all this or not. Um, but uh, you just, you just got to wonder how much press this is going to get. And why is that important? Because the more press it gets, the more popular it is, uh, the more apt it is to, to have a better model mission. So.